Hola community, it's Paolo Vasquez with another Blender Every Day, Blender Today Every Day edition, quarantine edition, where we just get to hang out, we get to see what's new in the Blender world and their artists and developers. Tomorrow there is a Q&A for developers, so uh, your questions that are more related to like what's happening in Blender or what, when is the asset manager coming or where is the, uh, all the, the typical ones, save them for tomorrow please, but today we have an artist in the house. We have more than an artist, it's like slash developer. We have a, uh, <laughs> it's also a loop making a VJ in the house. So <laughs> give it up for Mitch and Hello, Hello everybody. You're not live, buddy. How are you? Hey, I'm good. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, you do like yeah. shows anyway, so you're used to this thing, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. I wouldn't say I'm I'm the best live streamer on the planet. I've only recently uh, started mixing things up with different screens. So. Oh, <laughs> still fancy. learning, but it's it's fun. Yeah, All right. Definitely. So tomorrow, today, actually, I uh, I was planning to to pair you with another artist, but I think uh, by with the work that you do is really like deserves a whole hour uh, because uh, it oh, would be. It, I, I'm. It, it's very interesting the the work that you do like for people that are not familiar with them i'm gonna put it here on the website mantisa.xyz it's it's weird i mean sorry but <laughs> it's just, <laughs> no it's like, fine i don't know how to describe this it's like a kind of um uh, it's just you you had a, a, a or like a, a live called uh, getting weird with the mantisa <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was the it's at the blender conference really really nice epic and and it's just just <laughs> weird. So I am curious you. to know about everything, but especially focus on the loops. You have a section on your website called VJ Loops where you no. uh, give away that you make the loops and you just give them away, and they yep. they loop uh, great. Uh, if you've Thank seen you. it on Twitter, uh, see them again because the compression probably killed them. So <laughs> go to the <laughs> website and download the actual files and the blend files for to play yes. with this. So, how did you even start making loops? How does uh, how did you move into the loop? Uh... I don't know. That's a good question. Honestly, I've never really thought about it that much. I bounced around different uh, different parts. So, I started as a visual effects artist about ten years ago, and I did motion graphics and archviz, and I've done all kinds of stuff. But I always kept going back to just making weird stuff with VFX tools and. I don't know. I think after a while, I just decided I'm just going to go all in, <laughs> just keep doing that and see where it goes. Um, and then I sort of discovered that it's actually very, yeah, uh, it's a good style to mix for VJing and, and for doing loops for concerts or even music videos and other things or album covers. So um, I kind of rolled into it a little bit. And once I started making the VJ loops, I figured it would be a good way to kind of get artists' attention and and... The thing is, I, I love making stuff, and I don't really see the point if somebody else can use it, that it just sits here on a hard drive. So I figured I'd just give them away and see what happens. Um, and Ooh. people have been, I've seen them, I've gotten like cool Twitter messages from all over the world of people like spotting them somewhere or using them at a show. Or, and that's really fun because it's nice because that my work somehow gets used, but it's it's useful for everybody. So it is it is really like because it's uh, creative commons or cc0 even like public domain. Uh, public domain public domain so you don't even have to credit that's the, no because what people in a live show it's hard to hard credit to someone credit, if yeah. you're using it so i figured just public domain it and the and most people give me credit anyway because uh, they appreciate it which is cool but you know i've seen it at like music festivals with a hundred thousand people i've seen it in the background somewhere somebody's using it at a dj booth so that's kind of cool to that's see your work really sort of spread in weird ways <laughs> that's really cool so today we are going to uh, dive into some of this or even make one from scratch what do you think i don't know if we could do a full one but i can definitely show you some cool tricks um to to do when it comes to looping stuff, maybe loop some things that you might not think are possible. Like how do you? Like doesn't even look like a loop. I don't even know know how long is it. Like sometimes it's like ten seconds, but it doesn't really look like a like like a loop. It's that's the beauty yeah. of it. How do you even start making a loop? So for that, um, yeah, we can even look at maybe we can look at some of the files that you have. Uh, 
uh, that you made. Uh, oh, we can start from yeah. scratch. I think there are think... some questions already. Sorry. I think there are sure, some yeah, questions, but it. in case you are, uh, if you missed it, it's on the description or also go to blender.today. And now I'm also sharing it here on the chat where you can ask questions. We have already uh, a few comments already, uh, 13 questions. So uh, we're going to get to it in a bit, but let's see how, how <laughs> let's see the, the magic. What, what is it? How do you even start? Would you start by setting the length or is the length is something that you just come up with it while making it or? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen and I'll just, yeah. uh, I'll just dive into it. So let's see, share blender. <clears throat> there we go. Nice. There it okay. is. Hey, Blender, the latest Blender. You always use, you compile your own. Lately, yes. Uh, the last last year or so, I've been getting into it more. Um, just you know, because it's fun, and I wanted to learn how to do it. So it's kind of cool. Um, so I have for this live stream, I've stripped away all of my preferences. So it's vanilla Blender. Uh, usually, I've got it set up somewhat differently. But at least I could talk about some of the stuff that I do to make my work easier. So one of the things you can start with in your preferences is under animation, you can set your default interpolation to linear rather than Bezier. And that means all the animations you do won't actually have any curves on them. So if you loop them, they'll look like perfect loops. Oh, you're changing the user preferences because we can't see those. Oh, uh, OK. Um, so a different window. So you can open the, the editor maybe in the. Yeah, where are we? User preferences. There, yeah. there we go. So here in the animation, uh, you've got the default interpolation is usually set to Bezier. And I switched that over to linear because let's say I'm animating a camera through a tunnel and I want it to fly at the constant speed. I don't want to have to animate it and then go in and then change the uh, change the curves every single time. So yeah. to alleviate that, I just switch it and then we can get started. Um, so there's multiple ways to start things. Uh, let's start with a very simple and fun um, exercise, which is the displacement modifier. There's so much cool stuff you could do with it. Displacement but modifier. I also, yeah. Uh, and I also like to work with as many modifiers as possible so I can easily go in and change um, variation. So for example, when you do tour visuals for a show, a lot of the artists will ask, hey, can we have this thing, but maybe three different versions where it just loops slightly differently or it moves slightly differently. And if you've got everything set up in, uh, in in modifiers, it's very quickly to just change a texture or something like that. So that's why I do this. So I'll just start with a square, but I'm going to turn it into a sphere. Or with a cube, rather, and turn it into a sphere. So I'm going to drop on a subdivision surface and a cast modifier. Where are we? There we go. Set this to one. And now I know this is a perfect sphere, and it's got nice polygons, so we can start doing some cool stuff with it. So you need geometry oh. to start with, okay? Yes, I work with a lot of lot of geometry, a lot of heavy geometry. So I tend to not optimize a lot, um, just because I know I can set the modifiers to be ridiculously high during render time, and then just kind of figure it out in the viewport, let it render, and then look at it uh, when it's done. Could you uh, so, make the text bigger? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes. Let's like uh, one point five or one point four, one point. Something like this? Yeah, that's much better. All right, cool. Thank there you. Go. See what we can do. No worries. Um, so all I've done is just, you can do this with a sphere as well if you really want to. Um, I'm just showing how easy it is to, to manipulate this stuff. So first thing I'm going to do is set this to 30 frames a second and let's say 300 frames. So usually it's between 10 and 20 seconds. Most of the loops I do are either 10, 15, or 20 seconds. And um, for most shows, it's either 30 or 60 frames. Uh, so I kind of adhere to that a little bit. So, so you always set the, 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 the length first. Yeah, because uh, that way I can just start animating, and I don't have to worry about it. About Sometimes I'll extend it, but usually I work at the length that I've set first uh, just to keep it simple. So let's throw in a texture and the displays. Distorted noise will forever be my favorite. Of course. Whether if it disappears, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> and okay, so you deform. Just deform it. So now um, you can mess with it, but to actually get it to loop properly. That's a magic. Uh, yeah, that's kind of where, where the fun stuff happens. So I'm going to start with a circle, just a curve. And then I'm going to add in an empty. And this empty is actually going to control the coordinates of the displays. 
So in here, in the displays, I can set the texture coordinate to object, and I can select the empty. Um, and now when I move it around, you'll see the displays changes, and it does fun stuff. But what I can do as well is uh, now constrain this to that path. So that means the empty uh, is going to follow around a perfect loop of a path. And that's kind of the trick to getting it to work. So if I set this to 0 uh, for the first position, I'm going to animate it, and then set not the last frame, but the frame after last. Otherwise, you get a duplicate frame where the uh, frame empty after is in the, the last same position. Yeah. yeah. So the amount of times I have hit shift right arrow and then right arrow, I don't even know. <laughs> we should make a script for that. So, so basically, the it trick could, is yeah. that you make it, you make, you drive everything from an other object that does a perfect loop. So no matter yeah. what you attach to it, that's always going to be a perfect loop, basically. Yeah. So now you can see it in the viewport as it's turning; it loops perfectly, and I don't have to worry about it. I could do stuff like use follow curve. And then I could animate the um, the empty individually as well. So let's say I insert a single keyframe on the x-axis here, and then do 360 degrees on frame 301. Now it's going to turn with that. <clears throat> oh, so then you, you can attach that rotation to something else. Yeah, or just keep rotating it in different axes. But always in a perfect loop, the first and the last. But frame, always, always in a perfect loop. And now you get this really weird, whatever looking thing. <laughs> um, I, I wish I could tell you half of the stuff that I make, what it actually is, but I don't even know half of the time when I'm making it because I like experimenting. Um, and now that's it. Like you can start shading this, you can start lighting this, um, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. A really another fun trick that you could do with this. So let's say, let's bring Suzanne into this, seeing that it is a Blender live stream. Um, I'm going to do is I'm going to parent her to the displaced object. And then in the displaced object, I'm going to turn on instancing. Now we have a whole bunch of Suzannes. A scalar by face sizes. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to hide the original Suzanne here real quick so we can see what we're doing. Uh, cube, Suzanne, there we go. Now if we turn off display and render instancer, now he's got a whole bunch of Suzanne's doing funky stuff. <laughs> nice. So YouTube compression will love this. So this Yes, is... it's probably not super, super visible. So I'll drop down the subdivision level here so you can see a little bit better what's going on. Okay. And now you're... Fast... sorry, dupli faces you're using. Instances. They're Instances. not called dupli faces anymore. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but yeah, I still call them dupliverts and dupliverts a lot as well. But it, instancing, got instancing. instancing. I gotta, I'm an old fart. <clears throat> yeah, no, I. <laughs> I put curves. It's make the same. Uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. And the fun thing is, because this is now set up, I can just change the texture interactively while it's playing and see all the different effects. So that's what I really like about this kind of thing. It just allows you to messing around to mess around and once you've got this set up you can do whatever you need to do and, and just keep working Anything. um do you do you yeah. mix multiple loops like for example you can have this one going in like uh, 300 frames but then you can have another one going 600 frames so you have yeah. multiple level loops yeah i'll usually do that when you get like ui elements that need to turn around or something and then you can animate them at a quarter of the length half the length and um the full length and then usually what I'll do is I'll use keyframe modifiers to have them just repeat or continue on. Keyframe modifiers. Oh, like in the, um, the, in the curve, curve editor? modifiers. Yeah. So here, um, let's say I want to make this loop twice as long. Yeah. I could easily just change it to 600. 600. And then in all of the different keyframes here, go into modifiers add the cycles modifier <laughs> just to make it even more confusing <laughs> yep. right. um, and then i can either have it repeat or repeat with the offset and if i now copy this one to the other ones it's just going to keep looping infinitely and because of that point is at frame 301 it will still loop at the same point so let's say if we just keep going i might turn off the instancing for a second so it's a little bit more uh visible in the yeah in the viewport. Now you can see it just keeps looping perfectly and it'll and it'll come back and loop again.
and even the on the other way around too you could have some loops going in every 30 frames or every 60 yeah. as long as it's a multiple it's gonna work just fine yeah that's the only constraint you really have is having multiples of the of the frame so that's where working with like 25 or 30 frames per second is a little bit easier because you don't get weird values like 96 frames or 120 frames yeah. you could just you know it's like 30 60 90 it's a little bit quicker to to calculate in your head as always. um and uh, in, no. in this way, do you move uh, the camera? No, or you keep all the objects. Uh, moving the camera might um, break the... It depends. Um, here, I can show you another uh, example real quick. I can imagine that if you move the camera and you're using some kind of screen, um, screen uh, like depending, dependent effects, it might get a bit... Uh, I mean, um, it's not to too do. bad because even with Eevee, you can loop stuff perfectly uh, if you kind of know how to how to fudge it a little bit. So this is another really good example. If I do move the camera, one yeah. thing if you want to get into making VJ loops that you'll see everywhere is um, tunnels. Tunnels, yes. Just, is... After all these years, I just keep making tunnels and I keep getting asked to make tunnels. So there's so many ways of doing it. Um, well, let's have some fun with it. Yes. So. The first thing I'll usually do is actually animate the camera. So I have a fixed distance and I'll keep it simple for myself because um, that's what I started with at first. I would make something and then try to fly through it and then try to make it loop. But that just sets you up for failure because sometimes you've got objects that are like 3.7 meters long. So the camera has to travel in weird sort of lengths and it's hard to figure it out after the fact. So yeah. what I do now is I'll just set a keyframe on the camera at the start, and then again, uh, shift right and right to get to three frame, frame 301, and then set it to maybe 100 meters. So now, whatever I do, yeah. yeah, I know my tunnel is going to be 100 meters long, but that also means that I can put everything in a collection, use a collection instance, offset it 100 meters, and it will loop perfectly. So I'll do that and show show how that goes. But mm. collections are extremely useful for making loops, so that's really nice. Because you make a, you add all the objects, you put them in a collection, and you basically yeah. instance the collection, like the oh. like the duplicate groups. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you get you get fast render times for free because it's an instance, so it's not having to recalculate the geometry multiple times, and it's always going to be the same. So um, you can even have something like an object affecting whatever it is that you're making, but the collection will be the same at the, at the end of it again. So um, I'll just I'll just make one while we're talking to illustrate the point. Um, so I'll start with the cylinder because we are making a tunnel after all. Let's see, <laughs> I'm going to... This is a 101. Yeah. Tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> Loop cut it a million times. Yeah. Um, so do you have something in mind before making the the loop or you like do you design them first or you just go and then and I just you go there? with the flow yeah I don't really know what I'm doing uh well I know what I'm doing in terms of my actions but I don't know what the end result is going to be um do, do you yeah, have clients I, asking for specific stuff Sometimes, but I've noticed uh, the the longer I'm doing this, the more freedom they give me. Uh, the more they just send me a mood board with like all these random things. And they're like, if it kind of looks like this, it's cool. So usually I'll pick like a color palette or maybe a pattern or something that I can focus on and work around. But even then I, I try to experiment as much as possible. So let's try to get some, some layering in this tunnel. So I've got a solidify on here and I'm not going to fill the rim. So I turn that off. And by adding a second solidify, I can actually get multiple layers of thickness in this tunnel. So I don't have to do anything extra. I don't have to model it. And again, it's down mm. to being able to do extra things after the fact. Now, this is a trick that I've uh, shown and used so many times uh, already, but it still remains really cool. Um, you can use a texture to drive a vertex group. So you can get a procedural vertex group without actually having to do the work, um, which is really nice. It requires to make one first. So I'm going to call this mask really quick. Yep. And uh, when I go into vertex weight painting mode, you can actually see what's going on. So I'm going to use the mask. And this is new to 2.83. 
uh, this little checkbox. So if you're not using the beta yet, um, or the alpha or a version, it's coming. Yes. Uh, so if you turn this on, what it's going to do, it's going to invert the falloff type, but you'll see why that's useful in a second. And we turn on group add as well. So now what's happening is just filling the vertex group because we've set the falloff to invert. So it's completely full. And if we throw in a texture mask here and again, distorted noise, because it's so much fun. Because what's happening is now, yeah, the vertex group actually just gets propagated by the texture. So this is a dream for this kind of work because it means uh, if I go back into object mode, I can now do things like use a mask modifier and throw in the vertex group, and now I get a broken up cylinder. Wow. So if we fly through this, this is already starting to look like a VJ loop. Yeah. And this is the basis for, for many, many things. But the cool thing is, because it's a vertex group, you can manipulate it after the fact or use other modifiers with it as well. And let's say if I copy this uh, modifier, I'm just going to put another one after that. I'm going to call a second vertex group mask, oop, mask two. And I can have another vertex group on top of that doing something similar. Maybe have this one be smaller in size. And, and I could, for example, use it in a solidify modifier. So throw that in there, add in thickness. Now we're getting some really weird but interesting looking geometry. But that's the whole point, right? I mean, yeah, you, it's just. <clears throat> Did you see yeah, that there on. is, uh, sorry, speaking about the Solidify modifier, there is a new feature since a few days ago, actually. It was completed yes. um, when? Friday. Shell and rim vertex groups. Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> I'm probably very excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> so for people that don't know here, is that Solidify modifier now has, a, since a few days ago, has a new option for <clears throat> assign the shell and the rim geometry to a selected vertex <clears throat> group. <clears throat> So I guess that's like a wet dream for you <laughs> in this case. Yeah, every, anytime anybody asks, adds anything to vertex groups, I'm like, yes, yes, more, more. The only thing um, I'm I'm hoping that will someday happen, uh, that, the only thing that could drive me to help develop Blender, I think, is being able to use vertex groups as a mask in cycles and shading. That would be amazing. Mask in cycles could use, shading. Yeah, because you can use colors, but not weights. But if you could use the weights, then you could use it for both modeling and shading, and you can get some really crazy effects. Oh. But that's just a pipe dream. Well, so. I mean, everything <laughs> notes should bring that to should life. Be able to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm waiting patiently. <laughs> so, I mean, what if you just use a, a bitmap image? Wouldn't that also work? Like, if you could use masks as a bitmap? It, yeah, it, it works. But then I you lose the link between the. Um, the thing with the, the ah, procedural with the textures paint. is that yeah, they're 3D, yeah. so that I don't need UVs or anything. And yeah, then, yeah. Good point. It's, we'll get there. It's all good. What, what it can do now is already amazing, so I'm not complaining at all. <laughs> I'm having a good time. So uh, I'm going to add a... I'm just going to split all these edges. It's split. I'm completely missing it. Maybe you can search for it. Oh, um, no, it, they renamed it. I oh, know it was okay. It was uh, edge... No, yeah. it didn't. It wasn't renamed. Um, there was another one that was called renamed the um, the extrude region. No, something with the region was renamed, and then it became edge and loops. It was only edges. Okay. Um, so I've edge split all these different parts now, uh, and the reason is now they're all separate polygons being affected. But the cool thing with that is that we, um, if we now throw on something as smooth modifier. It's going to start trying to smooth those out and give you extra bits in between. And as you can see, the possibilities are endless. And yeah. I cannot tell you how many like happy accidents I've had over the years just messing with this stuff. <laughs> and ooh, now it's doing something really weird. And that is really cool. So what is something that you need to take care of when working on a loop? Like try not to get things. Uh, like, what, what, what is a, a don't when working on loops? Um, hmm. Or everything is valid. Just do yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. It's uh, the hardest part. I think the hardest part is figuring out the setup. Um, like I can make most things loop now. I can make particles loop. I can make cloth simulations loop. I can make um, anything mesh related loop pretty much. 
Um, now with the, the new VDB volumes, it's oh. actually possible to make VDBs loop. Um, but it's still, there's still, uh, I still have to figure out the, the details of it. Um, so with a bit of creativity, you can make pretty much anything loop. It's just, you have to understand the limits before you start. Uh, cause otherwise you're going to run into trouble. Like I said, if your mesh is like this weird shape or this weird length and you have to get a camera to fly through it and your whole setup is done. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's why I try to keep it as procedural as possible because you're going to have to fix something at one point. And if, if it's all sculpted and baked down and you have to redo everything, you're just going to hate yourself. <laughs> so. yeah. Have you ever reached a point where you like, uh, messed with your loop and then you can't get it back or something? Um, before I do that, I'll just hit save as yeah. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> just to be on the safe side. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And there's, there's so many things you could do like here with the camera. What I could do is I can animate it over the Y rotation axis as well. Oh. So that we get some circular movement. Now we get some really crazy looking things. Um, just, just keep doing this until your computer can't handle it anymore. Basically, yeah. <laughs> For the rendering, what 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 do you uh, prefer, Eevee or Cycles for for looping in particular? Um, it depends on the project, honestly. Uh, they both have their use cases. I found. Um, I really like the reflections that Eevee gives me because you can do if you want to do like cool reflective stuff really quickly. Um, that works really well. For a lot of the tunnels, because I do my compositing in Blender afterwards as well, so I need some of the passes from Cycle sometimes. Um, but with the new EV passes, I've been able to replicate some of that workflow as well. So it really depends on, for my personal work, what I feel like using. Sometimes I'll use one or the other. Um, like I've got still got less experience with EV, so sometimes I'll just use EV because I want to learn more about it. Yeah. Um, do you use yeah. other render engines outside of the two best ones? Um, before I used Blender, I used other stuff. Like I used Mental Ray, V Ray, Corona. Um, but since I switched to Blender, I've tried some of the other open source ones. But Lux. Cycles and Eevee are so well integrated, there's yeah. really no beating it uh, in, in Blender. So, yeah, I can can imagine Blender internal. <laughs> no, I, I no, I uh, I use it maybe for like particle trails once or twice back oh. in two point seven days. But I started using Blender. I think five years or so ago. So Cycles was already in there and I was already using it from the start. But yeah, nice. I, I've heard stories. Uh, <laughs> Blender, it's the best. I love Blender internal. Uh, uh, so after this step, what, what, what would you do? We still have a uh, half an hour. We can, uh, are you okay staying until the end? By the way, it's just didn't. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe we could do particles. questions after. How or... do you do... Oh yeah, particles. That could be a fun one. I'll show one last or, thing or, here, just or, yeah, for the collection. Particles or physics or like something weird. So yeah, here I'm just instancing that collection, and because now I've set it to 100 meters, I can know I just have to offset it 100 meters, and then you'll see towards the end of the loop. And I'm gonna skip through it here. You'll see okay. that it just loops perfectly. So you should. So the only. It the same yep. um the collection you just added one like instance shift a instance collection yeah and then maybe duplicate it uh once or twice until uh, because computer... yeah or until like the hole at the back of the tunnel is small enough that you don't really notice <laughs> and then sometimes i'll use the camera clipping as well so the the end of where it's rendering stays consistent between the loops or some because um, if you something. look yeah, if you look very closely, you can see here, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, that the end of the tunnel extends a little bit because yeah. the camera clipping goes further out. Yeah. But I know I've got two loops at the end, so that means I've got 200 meters. So if I set my camera clipping to, let's say, 100, just to be on the safe side, now it's going to stay the same. And then in compositing, I'll add like a big glow or whatever to hide the fact that there's a bit of a hole there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now you've got basically a perfect loop. Um, yeah. Wow. But we'll uh, particles. We'll we'll do some particles because that's always fun, uh, and it uses some some interesting parts of Blender as well. Wow. Yeah, and especially looping. How it's just, there's nothing with less control than particles or physics or how do you even? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get around it. Let me put it that way. There's okay. two ways of doing it. 
one way which is a little bit more reliable and the other which is a little bit more of a pain in the butt. <laughs> so I'm going to go for the reliable way today, but I'll, I'll also talk about the other way to do it. So I'm just going to do something very simple. Um, actually, let's start with something. Um, um, just a sphere. So, or something you have like so that. many add-ons. Uh, oh, it's just the it's one. It's just the extra, the extra objects add-ons, actually. Those are two of the add-ons that I always immediately uh, enable, just because they have a few extra cool objects that you can use. Um, and I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to say I try to avoid modeling, but I'm not a very fast modeler. So <laughs> if I can start with a good base shape, then that's always preferable. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody on the chat today say that. Uh, yeah, they they uh, they learned that with, with you. They learned that they can be crappy modelers and still make awesome stuff in the <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, of course. In the, in the in the way that you don't need to like model a hyper realistic something if you just uh, make it glitchy. Yeah, exactly. You can get away with a lot of stuff um, with like moody lighting or, or funky shading or things like that. And that's kind of the fun of it. So the first thing I've done, and this is usually in my like my own default file, I always leave gravity turned off um, because I like the way uh, when you start messing with par particles and forces, without gravity, you immediately start getting cool shapes. So let's just start with this. Uh, and I'm going to have it emit from frame one to frame 300. And let's say we'll give them a lifetime of 150 frames just to have something to start with. Yep. Um, and then I'm going to have to adjust some settings here. So I'm just going to make them a little bit smaller. Hmm. Uh, something weird going on with my build, maybe. So disregard that. <laughs> <laughs> Particles? Yeah, the you scale build your own of blender. the... Uh, Hmm? You build your own. I, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I wouldn't say I'm very good at it yet because I still get weird glitches sometimes, and it, it's more me than Blender. Because whenever I download the daily build from the website, it it's like, hmm, it works in this one. So what am I doing? Wrong? Well, the thing is that the Blender uh, live stream, the Blender live stream. Sorry, I was uh, the the Blender um, build bot has its own libraries built in, and when you compile mm -hmm. it, it's using your own libraries. Um, I, yeah, I use the pre-compiled ones now for CentOS, I believe. So that sort of solves the problem because I used yeah. to have a lot of issues with the libraries on my my install, but eh, I'll get there eventually. Like I said, it's a learning process and it's part of the fun. Mm -hmm. So see, I'm not going to give them any velocity and I'm going to change the... No velocity, so you don't want them to go... No, I just want them to be affected by the force itself because we want to give them like a cool sort of interesting like look it. here. So you remove yeah. the, the velocity so they are only affected by the force fields that you add. Yeah, exactly. And um, what I do change as well is change the color from material to velocity so I can see which particles are going slow and which particles are going fast. And let's do 10,000 because I'm feeling adventurous. Which graphics cards do you have? Uh, I've got four graphics cards in this machine. So um, yeah, <laughs> enough to do funky stuff. <laughs> OK, it might be very warm in there. Yeah. Um, so let's just look at this. Um, and a fun trick to use as well, if you want to have your turbulence change a little bit over over time, you can use a fixed size. Yeah. That way kind of look at how big we want all of this to be. Let's see, like this maybe. Then, because I am a lazy person. Yes, lazy for the win. Yes, um, I'm going to use a driver to change uh, the direction and uh, speed of the force. Uh, the force. Um, <laughs> but uh, the driver's panel is great and all, but I like to just type hashtag frame yes, and then divided by some arbitrary number. And this will give me random rotation on the force without having to do anything at all. So now the force changes over time. OK, so people who didn't get that hashtag frame or hashtag hash, frame. hash frame 
means the current frame number. So in frame 50, it's going to yeah. be 50. And come, it's it's a reliable way to add like a random, but not so random. It's actually like a seed. Yeah. And the cool thing is um, you can divide it or multiply it by different values. So you could speed it up and slow it down. And because it's, it's keyframe independent, let's say the loop has to be 600 frames. I don't have to change anything to it because it'll just keep going. Um, now, you might be thinking, okay, so we've got this... Um, We've got the simulation now, but how are we going to actually properly loop it? So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we have, we're able to cache out all the particles for the whole extent of their lifetime. Okay. And this is something uh, where, and I only figured this out recently. I never knew what this little button down here was. I don't know if I can um, see it here. There's a little stopwatch next to your start and end frames in the timeline. Yeah. Yes, you can have an alternative timeline length I did not know this until I think a few months ago and it oh. blew my mind because I've been changing the end of the timeline for so long. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was really happy to find it. But it's right there. Um, no, it's, it's Yeah, uh, but yeah. I never clicked it. So I never really, I was like, yeah, whatever. It's I think we need to maybe to work on, so, on the new something. icon or so. Yeah. But um, the cool thing is now you can do your simulations without having to change the, the end of your loop or whatever. So I know, okay, I'm starting at frame one, I'm ending at frame 300, and I've got a lifetime of 150. So I need 450 frames at least for all the particles to have simulated uh, to have come and gone. So I'm setting this to, let's say, 500 just to be on the safe side. Um, and all I'm going to do is under cache, I'm going to bake this. Yeah. And it's baked. So now we just have our and our particles baked. We can scrub through them, whatever, and you'll see they'll disappear towards the end. Now, I want to do two things. I want to figure out a way to get this to loop properly. And I want to make sure that when the particles die, they don't just disappear. Because that's it doesn't look good. It, uh, it doesn't look quite it as nice. It's so, magic otherwise. Yeah. So in um, usually when you're using particles and you're using particle instances, you'll go down to rendering it as an object or a collection. But um, if you want to loop them the easy way, uh, you make the object that you want to instance over the particle system. And on that object, you use the particle instance modifier. So it's another way of looking at it, but it basically means that this is a... Um, mesh now that you could export and bring in and do stuff with. So um, mesh. So you're yes, I could export it as an Alembic cache and bring it back in. Oh. So that's sort of the trick to it. Now, one of the things uh, by default, this particle instance is set to show the unborn and the dead particles. So we just want to show the ones that are alive. That's what we're going to do. And the other thing we need to do is use a texture in the particle system of all things. <laughs> <laughs> what is the point of using the, the texture? What, what brings it? It allows you to map a uh, texture over the time or the age of the particle, which means you can use it for all kinds of things. For example, I'm just going to call this one scale. So I've added the texture in the bottom of the particles here. I'm going to click the button to go over to that uh, texture. And now if I set this to blend, you've got this influence tab that you can open up. And if you turn off general time and you set it to size instead, nothing's going to change just yet because I need to change one thing in the cube and tell it to respect the size of the particles. And now they're actually going to grow over time, but I'd have to double check. Yeah. And just look at the size of the particles real quick. So you're using the gradient of the texture. Yeah. So now you'll see they'll actually they grow from the start. I don't know how visible this is going to be. Yeah, now we see it. Um, and the cool thing is what you can do is if we go back to this texture, down in the colors tab, you can actually activate the color ramp and set it up so that they uh, are big in the middle of the loop. And then if we change the first and last colors to black, they'll actually get, they'll start small and they'll get bigger and then they'll get small again by the time that they disappear again. Uh. But they should at least, if I set this to the mapping to strand or particle. Now it's going to use the age of the particle, and you'll see they're small, they become bigger, and then they become smaller again. So now they seamlessly appear and disappear, and that really helps uh, with you know just making it loop. Making the loop visible. So, yeah. 
yeah, making it look like it doesn't really loop. Um, so now with that object selected, I'm going to save my file first, just to be on the safe side. Uh, Please. Untitled is fine. <laughs> we don't want to redo this. No, this has been um, around for, for a while. Actually, you have autosave too, so. Yeah, that's true. Um, so we'll export this as an Alembic. I'm just going to leave it at untitled. I'm going to set the end frame to 500, because we want all of those particles to work. Only the selected objects. I don't really need UVs or normals. That's fine. And you can deselect export here in particles because it's exporting the final mesh because of that modifier rather than the particles themselves. We don't so, see that window, so it's good that you explain. Oh, it. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's exporting now. Um, You're exporting wonder, to Alembic. Yes. Is there a way to show that window? Um, you can share the screen. In the preferences, I think. Wait, maybe and we can there's see a way everything. to do it. I, no, I'm, the browser doesn't allow me to share the full screen. Like I can share my screen, but then it shares my three monitors, and then everything's <laughs> going to be too small. <laughs> so that's not going to work. OK, yeah. we, can, we can imagine it. It's uh, export Alembic, and you disable the. Let's see. You, did, you select the, all the selected objects. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to see it now. Ah. So all I did was change the start and end frame so to 500 because we have that whole simulation that we want to export. Yeah. Just the selected objects, and I've turned off UVs and normals and everything, and uh, hair and particles as well because it's the mesh that it's exporting because we use the particle instance modifier. Yeah. Um, if I'm going super fast for some people, I totally understand, but we only have an hour, so. <laughs> I'm just going to go through the whole process, and then people can ask questions at the end, or you know, come find me on social media as well. All right, um, that might not be a bad idea. So I'm going to turn everything off in the viewport now. I'm going to import that Alembic. There we go. Now, if I just play it, it works just fine. Ooh. I can set it to shade flat. Oh yeah, because you have the normals. Yeah, I've been turned off, so it's no big deal. Um, but now to actually get this to loop right. I'm going to import it a second time. Second time. But yes, on the second one, what you can do is um, use the frame offset. So if I offset this minus 300 frames, which is the length of our animation, what's going to happen is it's going to start at 300 frames for one, and it's going to restart the new one from the beginning. And now it looks like there's just a seamless loop. And you're just oh. putting two caches with an offset. It's yeah. it's just it's all of these tricks. They seem they're quite easy when you finally see them happening. It's not rocket science. I'm not doing any cra anything crazy. I'm just taking the data and making sure there's enough data for an overlap and offset is offsetting it that way. You could do so. this with any anything because exporting a yeah. supports everything really. So you can do yeah. it with a character with the uh, anything exactly yeah and i even do it um outside of alembic you've got point cache and mdd yeah. older formats so as long as your um yeah well with the cool thing with the point cache is as long as your mesh doesn't change topology like a cloth simulation you could do the same thing on one object so you can just have two cache modifiers uh looping and then animating through each other, and you have like a, a flag that animates endlessly. So it can it's work with cloth, endlessly. with soft bodies, with uh, yep. rigid bodies, with anything really, yeah. anything that you can export as Alembic, which is everything really. Yeah, it's super cool. That's amazing. OK, I uh, um, want to answer some questions. Yes, I think this could be a good time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> we have 10 minutes, so. <laughs> 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 All right, so let's let's see the questions. So um, there are a number, but let's let's start from the top. Yes, the first question: Quark ask uh, Quark Natom, um, how would you make loops of simulation? Yay! Just this, we just answered this. <laughs> yes, the trick to any looping any simulation is caching it out. Basically, caching it out. Okay. Yes. Um, to that effect, I have a YouTube video where I show all the different ways to loop stuff. Oh. Um, yeah, if you go to my YouTube channel, it's a yes. 2.7 video, but all of the all of the information still applies. And I loop particles, cloth simulations, um, 
animations and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so you can reference that. Do you know? Wanna, do you remember the it. name of the video? Ish. Yeah, it's yeah. I have this series called Weird Shit, <laughs> uh, and the name of the episode is called Luscious Loops. Okay, so, so Luscious Loops here. I'm gonna paste it on the chat so people can get it. Here we see it two years ago. But it's completely uh, possible right now. Actually, what we see, yep. what we saw the before this, this particular instance modifier has been there for years. So there's yep, really exactly. nothing, uh, nothing crazy. It's a very underrated modifier, in my opinion. And a video. <laughs> awesome. So I'm actually going to reply here to the user also with the video. Next, um, or actually, you know, this is a, a pro tip for people in the chat that you can do curly brackets YouTube and then the ID of the YouTube video, and then it's going <laughs> to embed it there. So nice. <clears throat> <clears throat> next, um, next question. Pablo, do you think for your everyday entertainment at the end of my workday, keep it up? Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, people are thanking nice. these videos. Actually, uh, also in the chat, people saying that this is a nice concept, you know, like the tutorial and then some uh, idiot asking questions that <laughs> try to... Oh, it's all good. It's fun. Like, it's it's cool to kind of get to show some of the weird stuff that I'm using every day. Um, I love somebody it. somebody can I'm, learn I'm, something from it, it's great. I'm literally getting paid for, like, learning stuff. So <laughs> let's <laughs> nice. do it every day, three times a day. <laughs> so, okay, the question for you would be, which are your favorite techniques to hide the loop for a loopable animation um, to hide favorite techniques to hide the loop. You said the glow at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some. I think most of the hiding that I do would just be in compositing in general. Um, okay. Mainly, for example, if you want to loop over a landscape that you create with a plane and a displace modifier, a great trick is to mirror it and then array it. And then the mirror will be the, the end of it will connect the other one automatically. And most of the time, you don't really see that it's mirrored if you jiggle the camera a little bit. So it's all about, yeah, either messing with your camera animation to make the seamlessness not seem uh, as, yeah, or make it more, make it look more seamless than it is. But the other part of it is um, don't be afraid to just put stuff next to each other. Like if you want to have two cloth animations that loop and they don't really meet up at the end, just stick them together and render it and see if you can see it to begin with and then fix it afterwards. I think that's a better approach for some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, thanks for the advice. And uh, and uh, something that I think I don't have, I've never made loops, but uh, uh, something that comes to mind is that maybe not don't make something too obvious, like an explosion at the end of the loop, <laughs> because mm -hmm. then you're going to exactly. see it. Right? I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. silly advice, but maybe... <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it depends. Sometimes you want that, right? Sometimes I'll have to put yeah. a client logo at the end of a loop. So every 20 seconds, their logo shows up and you fly through it or something. But generally, for just seamless loops, there's so much you can do. And the thing is, it doesn't only apply to um, to making VJ work. Like I said, a, a cloth animation of a flag that loops that you can reuse a few times and offset, you only have to animate it once, cache it once, but you can use it maybe 20 times in a scene. If you make it really long and just offset it a little bit, then you've got 20 flag animations pulling from one piece of data yeah. and it's super optimized. So, yeah. Yeah, super optimized because you just reuse everything. Uh, next, actually part of the same question, what makes motion graphics great in your view? Um, there's no rules. There's no rules. <laughs> yeah, bad topology can be a cool render. So, um, that's something I noticed when I used to work in a studio and in a pipeline that I enjoyed it, but I didn't like the limitations that it was that it was giving me because I like to experiment and be weird. And a lot of my work tends to revolve around broken geometry or weird doing just horrible things to meshes. And I get comments on YouTube as well. People are like, what are you doing? Like, that's bad topology. I'm like, but it doesn't matter because it renders and it looks cool. So that's my favorite thing about motion graphics, that there is no rules. You can just do whatever. And if it renders, it renders great. And it renders. I was just showing here, uh, you have a training on the Blender Cloud on motion graphics, actually. Yep. That you did a while, a while back. But it's also interesting to to see, even though it's an older Blender version, I think it still applies. Mm -hmm. most of it. Yeah, a lot of the tricks still apply. Uh, some of the stuff that I talked about today is in there as well. Um, so it's it's still it's still very relevant. Next question, um, Mitch, how hot are you for the fracture modifier? <laughs> uh, 
I'm yeah, I'm waiting patiently. I guess um, with all this stuff, I I try not to get too excited about things um, because sometimes it takes a little while longer. And um, I've experimented with it in the past, and it's fun. Um, there's just certain things that I want to do with it. I come from a visual effects background using certain tools that are super specialized for that stuff. And I always want to try to push everything to the limit immediately. And um, then you you kind of feel like, okay, this still needs some time or this still needs a little bit of extra extra coding here and there. But um, I am excited about it. Any, any new tool that comes in, I kind of, a lot of my work gets based around trying something new because you can't, you, can't really be expected to be creative every single day. So generally what I'll do is just I'll pick a tool and I'll be like, hey, can I make an animation with this? Or can I make a cool shape with this? And that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from at the same time as well. So it's learning and then just kind of outputting whatever I've learned uh, into a new piece of work, so. Thank you. Uh, notes, have you tried the notes, the notes stuff? The functions were um, uh, Yeah, I've messed with the particle nodes mostly, um, but yeah, I've got so much work to do at the moment that as much as I want to play with them, um, it's still, it, it's not crashing as much as it used to, but still enough to where I'm like, I can't spend too much time on this because then you actually need to get things done and I'll just get sucked into a black hole playing with particles all day. But I do check it out every now and then, yeah. <laughs> cool. Animation notes, have you tried it? Yeah, so I've used it on a few projects here and there, um, but I'm kind of holding out for everything nodes and just um, when that starts coming, I'm just going to dive into it and completely go into there. So awesome. Um, a few questions for the developers tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow, same place, same time, the developers Q&A. Um, next, uh, let's see. More love for architecture. That's also for tomorrow <laughs> or <laughs> yes. somewhere uh, elsewhere. <laughs> um, let's. Uh, Okay, actually, let's go to the bottom ones because they are the ones that were first asked. So, modifier and geometry. I am very fascinated from Antisa Art. He really deserves a round of applause. Yes. And thank you for putting it. I hope to see more tutorials from him. Working on it, working on yeah. it. It's and more also, a scheduling thing rather than anything else. So. And all the, all the sharing <laughs> stuff, it's amazing. Thank you for sharing stuff. So. Um, oh, now, the to. question. So, well, I, actually, it's not for you. It's that the output geometry of a modifier will be accessible in the future. Um, I guess so. It, with the modifier, no, it's hard with to the know. Notes, at the moment. Yeah. Um, and then the modifiers will be driven out by everything nodes framework. Uh, again, this question is for um, developers, <laughs> but I guess everything is it's hard to see <laughs> to say. <laughs> this is for you. Okay, uh, displacement modifier or shader. What do you prefer? Um, it really depends on the situation. For movement and animation, modifier. For um, like stills or doing crazy stuff with it, definitely shading. Shading. So. And really generally, cool. I'll use a mix of both, actually. Mm. Do you sculpt? Um, sometimes, but I'm not showing it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the cloth brush has gotten me into sculpting lately. Yeah. Because uh, I like to just make get like a, a head bust or whatever and start sculpting on it with a cloth brush and you get really creepy things. Really I, I saw you like made that. something really <laughs> disturbing the other day with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was somewhere there. It was like, eek. But uh, nice. that's yeah. what art should <laughs> do for you. Well, yeah, I guess it's a reaction. Should, so exactly, I guess I'm doing something you. right. <laughs> Okay, uh, Gris Pencil, have you done? These are questions that actually I am making in the, in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Gris Pencil, have you used it? Do you, are you interested in it? Um, yes, I use it to draw on meshes to create creepy monsters. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, what I used to do with the skin modifier, I sometimes do with Grease Pencil now to draw like veins or, or other weird stuff. So it's fun. Good. Um, then I also question this also for developers, but it says uh, we use a 3D cursor in Blender. Do you use a 3D cursor in Blender? Uh, sometimes, mainly just for snapping stuff or moving things around or getting the rotation right on something. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> child of constraints. So yeah, these questions are for the developers um, and also for the developers. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a developer by any chance? You you do develop you code you code right? 
Uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a developer, but I've made a couple of add-ons and tools and things. You have, so, right? Um, uh, yeah. have. You have a GitHub yeah. page. It's fun. I, I need to get back into it a little bit more, um, but I've just been busy. But I, I do enjoy it. I finally wrapped my head around how Python works in Blender and that once you get a feel for it, it's really cool what you can do with it. So um, I would recommend anybody that's even thinking about it just to try it out and mess with it. Don't think it. Just really go cool. and do it. And the best way to do it also is to open a, a like read a an, an add-on mm -hmm. already and just get into it. For example, here you have the random mesh add-on that <laughs> you just look at the it's code. It's just mesh. <laughs> it's literally one uh, one file and it has all the, the classes where you can read and what it's doing. And uh, I bet you added comments everywhere. That's super nice. Okay. Well, also shout out to Dr. Sibrin's cloud uh, course, Scripting for Artists. I got yes. a lot from that as well. So that's very, very worth it. it he's actually on the chat. So hello, uh, Sibrin. Oh. Yes. So Scripting for Artists is uh, the, the training that he was released um, on the cloud in the past, but it's still valid for nowadays. And there are updates actually on the um on on the here on the youtube channel here in this you can find new videos mm -hmm. is any video coming Sivren? answer us in the in the comments i think we reached uh, i think we reached the all the questions let let me refresh one more time and um let's oh there are a few more so oh good i have time so you have time yeah, <laughs> yeah i don't mind sticking around <laughs> i mean as long as they are for for uh, for you for the art and not for the developers and no i think uh, uh, <laughs> i gave up let's uh <laughs> it takes time you know i for two years yeah, i've been doing live streams answering questions that were supposed to give it to the developers and now i'm starting to doing this art thing so uh it's gonna it's gonna take a while but um i think i ask you also all the questions that i have what, what can we expect from you in the in the, in the future you're busy now with uh, client work uh do you, yeah yeah you also do um, live streams on your on your yeah channel. i do live streams on youtube every now and then um i would love to do a whole bunch of them but time doesn't always allow unfortunately but um yeah i'm thinking of maybe doing something but i'm not sure what it is going to be yet but definitely if you want this kind of content uh, check out my youtube channel and uh yeah join the streams everybody's welcome i usually stream for about an hour and a half to two hours uh, when I do. So two hour we take our time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I usually just grab some of my personal work that I've done lately and just go dive into it, show people what I did, because uh, it's kind of interesting. I get a lot of questions on social media about it. So it's the best way to kind of show people stuff. I just, uh, I am looking at the creepy dude with the, ah, there you go. With the cloth <laughs> face and. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. Uh, I think I, I got all the questions answered um, there. It's It's been so nice to, I, I learned a lot. It's been um, a very fruitful live stream. I hope uh, you get even more audience now because it's really the kind of work that you do is pretty, pretty unique, experimental. I, I bet um, it really, I don't know, how, how does it, how do you even come up with this stuff? No, you that's it. Yeah. Just, well, just, just do it. And that's also super hard because when people ask me what I do, I still don't have an answer for them. It's like I make art, I guess. That's the easiest way to, to yeah, to describe it. Because even it's like it's motion graphics, but not really, but kind of. It just kind of goes all over the place. So, yeah. All but it's fun. Thank you for having me. I had a really great time. Please. Pleasure is mine. I think we should do it again at some point. Again, if I keep doing it. I, I, I think with that one hour we were fine at, at some point. Sure. I thought it was not going to be enough, but I think we managed. Um, we should uh, we should do it again sometime. Thank you again for for sharing your art. Thank you. You provided a bunch of graphics for the Blender always and then from the Blender conference in the last year. Yeah, yeah. You made the graphics actually from uh, from the Blender conference Blender Conf um, from last year. So too bad that there's no video. However, in the Blender conference last year for the party, uh, Mitch made the uh, graphics. And yeah, all Andy, the VJ stuff. Yeah. Yes, and Andy made the music for it, which you can actually find. It's just a little shout out that you can mm -hmm, uh, find yeah. the Andy's music. It's on the Blender conference Twitter and Andy's Twitter as well. 
Yeah, right. and he grabbed Sorry. for the cover. He grabbed one of my loops and then did something with it as well. So right. there's, it's all connected. It's all connected. It's all one. It's a blender, yeah. it's a blender family. So, exactly. Yeah, super nice. All right, I think I I'm gonna leave to you. Cool. To have a, the rest <laughs> of the day. Thank you. I already stole too much time from you. Um, it's fine. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> really, cool. no problem. All right, so I'm gonna switch to full screen. I'm gonna say goodbye to you in, in a bit. So. Uh, sure. Talk to you soon. Bye, yeah. community. Uh, everybody. Bye, bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Your audio is still up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, just gotta get, say goodbye. Thank you again for uh, staying until the end. This is the first time we do something like this with like the heavy uh, sharing of the screen. I know for a moment it was very low resolution. I'm gonna work on that. Maybe having a bigger uh, or like a different maybe. Uh, I don't know, another way to share maybe more quality. I think it was also the size of the window. I had it too small. I hope uh, it was more about seeing the, the, like not which buttons and which values to press, but more about the workflow. I think the tutorials that, uh, this is, was kind of a tutorial and the training and tutorials that I like to see here are not really for like complete, complete beginners. You need to know a little bit of, of, of Blender here. You need to know how to navigate, how to add objects and maybe modifiers and stuff. So in the future, I plan, uh, now that I did this, it's amazing, I am learning. <laughs> so it's <laughs> so it's really uh, something I plan to do in the future, maybe inviting another artist and see more of their workflow. But uh, again, not, not completely for beginners. So uh, it's more about the workflow. How do you even use Blender in weird ways? So thank you again for staying until the end. It's been amazing. Okay. Um, tomorrow we have the Q&A, the questions and, questions and answer. So prepare your questions, the ones that like, we couldn't answer today. You can ask them tomorrow. And um, it's been um, it's, it's been a great week. I skipped two days, but I did the Blender recap, by the way, with all the new stuff. So go check that out. I'm already thinking of the recap for next week, number 97, and then we are reaching the 100. I need to know what we're going to do to celebrate 100 episode of Blender today in quarantine. Okay, that's it. That's all for this week. Thanks again. Remember that in 54321, 